Uh, well, first of all, thanks um, for the lovely welcome, Alexandra. It's very nice to, to be here and see you all. There's lots of familiar faces. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back in Guelph. Um, I'm here primarily because uh, Krista Morrissey is uh, handed in her PhD. Um, she's a joint student of mine and Tina's, and she worked in Scotland for a few years. And I, I'm delighted to be here for her exam. So it's really fortunate to, to bring the two together. Um, for this talk, I'm really sandwiching two things together. So please bear with me. We're going to gallop through them in, in the time we've got. So if we talk about the, the modern laying hen and what we've got nowadays, poultry industry used to be like this. This is a picture out of the National Geographic from 1927. This is what the poultry industry was in, in the old days, as I, as I still call it. Um, you know, the farmer's wife feeding a mixed flock of birds uh, in the farmyard. But we've actually, you know, in grand scale of things, we've very rapidly gone from that kind of poultry housing to things like this, okay, okay? conventional cages, kind of old things. This is a particularly dirty system. But probably more commonly nowadays, we've got these more modern systems. We've got uh, aviary systems, this one on the left, so multiple tiers that hens can go up and down in. Uh, the picture in the top right is a, just showing you a free range system, so there's pop holes to the outdoors. And the bottom right picture is a furnished cage system or an enriched cage system where the birds are in cages but they've got perches and nest boxes and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this part of the talk I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to talk about how and why we've made such rapid changes to the way hens are housed. What are the consequences? And so to do that, I'm going to look at a brief history of chickens, and then we'll focus on hen welfare and different housing systems. So uh, for those of you who um, maybe poultry is not your strong point, just to give you a little history lesson, uh, the domestic chicken that we know nowadays um, comes from the jungle fowl, which these pictures are representing. You've got a cockerel at the top and a, a hen at the bottom. And jungle fowl live in dense forests, in harem groups that where there is a dominant male, adult females, and there are associated juveniles and chicks. And they'll spend a lot of their time foraging, looking for food. A lot of their waking day is spent just looking for food. So that makes up a big part of their behavioral repertoire. And also importantly, they're insectivores. They don't just eat plant matter, which is mostly what we feed them nowadays. And poultry were first domesticated by the Romans about 8,000 years ago. In fact, they made uh, quite a specialized industry of it. But when the Roman Empire disappeared, so did those skills. And the commercial egg production that we kind of know today really started to develop in the late 1800s. And at that time, birds were dual purpose birds. So they weren't specifically laying hens and meat chickens. They were birds that were used for both purposes. And they were kept on mixed farms. So you might have cattle, you might be, uh, have arable areas growing crops, and you also had chickens. And they didn't have vaccinations, or there were very few. And the birds were exposed to predators. They might live in naturally lit barns, like you see in this picture. And they were in mixed sex groups. They were able to mate naturally and rear their own young and so forth. And they were fed homegrown cereals and kitchen scraps, and they were able to forage on the stubble of the uh, crops after they'd been harvested. And these things that I've highlighted in yellow meant that birds didn't really reach their potential. They maybe got picked off by predators. They died prematurely because they got, had contracted diseases. And they didn't grow to their full potential because they were being kind of fed scraps and expected to rummage around on their own. But then other aspects of this, the way they were housed and because they were fed scraps, meant that it was cheap, cheap to keep poultry. So there were some significant improvements that started to come into place in the late 1800s and early 1900s in that vaccines were developed for, specifically for poultry and also people started to make compound feed with added vitamins and minerals um, with dietary specifications that were good for poultry and meant that they could maximize their potential in terms of growth and you reduced mortality. So those made some major improvements to the way uh, birds were kept. But you also got this really important factor when it came to poultry in that there was divergence in birds that were kept for different purposes. So there was selection for bird strains that were good egg producers, and there was selection for birds that were good at depositing muscle, which makes meat. And this is a picture from one of the Finnish research groups where they show you how different those two uh, diverse lines now grow to. So after seven weeks, you can see on the left, you've got a layer chick. Um, she's still quite small. She looks juvenile. 
compared to her seven-week-old broiler sister, who looks comparatively enormous. She's still juvenile, um, but she's, she's really big and very heavy. And so today, um, I'm just going to focus on what's happened as a consequence of selection for the laying hen. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the 1900s, the hens were still largely reared and housed as adults with range access. And cages as we know them, um, people refer to them as battery cages because they're in long lines. Those didn't become popular until about the 1950s. And the reason those came into being was because, well, first of all, you have better use of space because you can layer birds up the way. But it also, really, the reason they were first used was because they were housed individually and farmers could then identify birds that weren't producing eggs or not very frequently and they could get rid of them and put new birds in. So they were only keeping the birds that were producing eggs. But a subsequent <coughs> consequence of putting birds in cages was that because you were separating birds from their own droppings, you also really increased hygiene and you reduced disease and mortality. So that was an added benefit of putting birds in cages. And just to give you a picture of how laying hen housing has swung so rapidly from, from one method of housing to another, these are some figures that I've got from uh, an article by Houston in 1986. The first three figures you see, 1951, 1965, and 1980, are all based on the proportion of hens housed. The last figure, 2015, are government figures about the number of eggs produced, but it still gives you, they're very similar at the end of the day. And so you can see in the early 1950s, uh, virtually very few of the birds were kept in cage systems. There were 12% in barn, and most of them would be classed as free range. But within 15 years, less than 15 years, we've got more than half the flock uh, in cages and a mixture of the rest of the flock in barn and free range. So barn means they're loose housed on the floor but they don't have access to the outside and free range means they do have access to the outside. But by 1980, the, all, virtually all of the UK flock were kept in cages. And then we swing back around the other way. So by 2015, which is the last year we've got for complete egg figures, we've only got about half our flock in cage <coughs> systems now. They're only allowed to be in furnished cages, but the rest of the flock are now free range, barn, or organic. <coughs> so really rapid changes in a, short proportion, in a short space of time. So if we have a look at the way that laying hens are reared and the various ways they can be housed, we can look at the kind of consequences that has for bird welfare. <coughs> so one of the first issues we come to is when you uh, hatch out eggs from p laying parent stock, we have half our chicks are male and half of them are female. Well, male chicks don't lay eggs, so they're not a lot good to the laying hen industry, and so uh, those chicks get destroyed. It's not worth rearing them for meat production because it's so much cheaper to rear a broiler chicken uh, to slaughter weight. They, they reach slaughter weight so much quick, more quickly. And so those male chicks, unfortunately, are killed. And the most common methods are by gassing or by maceration. Now, if, if the method of death is quick, so if the equipment's maintained properly, it's used properly, um, then, then death is rapid. So is death a welfare issue if uh, pain and any sort of sentience of what's happening is incredibly short? Well, maybe not, but you could certainly argue, is it morally and ethically right? Do we feel comfortable hatching out all these chicks and then just, just destroying them? Now, in the UK, we have a very healthy market for using those chicks for the um, raptors, zoos, uh, birds of prey. In fact, we have such a market there that all our chicks get gassed and they go to these kind of places and the demand for chicks is so great that there is some degree of importation of chicks into the UK. So they are being used, um, but you could still argue it, it's not something that people are comfortable with. Okay, so we now have our beautiful female chicks. What happens to them? Well, they have to go on farm to be reared. And the kind of welfare issues that chicks, uh, female chicks, which are also known as pullets have, they're actually generally few in the UK. Um, pullets are provided with ad libitum access to food and water. Um, the feed is a compound feed developed specifically for their needs. They've got fresh water, they've got shelter, they live in heated houses. 
Um, they're usually vaccinated. There are some organic producers that maybe don't vaccinate their flocks, but most majority of the birds in the UK are vaccinated. They can be reared in either uh, cage systems or barn systems, and that depends on what they're going on to live in when they're adults. But one of the, the, the major insults to bird welfare when they're pullets is that the birds are routinely beak trimmed. And we use the infrared method, and that's done at day old. So we talk a little bit about beak trimming, because that's the major concern here. The reason beak trimming is uh, performed is to reduce the potential for causing damage, mostly later in life. Feather pecking and cannibalism tend to be a problem that hens express when they're adults. It's not so common when they're, they're younger, although it can happen. And in the UK, we've gone through a period of debate recently about whether or not we should ban routine beak trimming because it is an insult to the bird. And uh, in November 2015, in part uh, due to evidence that Krista uh, found in her research work, um, we agreed uh, as, an or as a the beak trim action group um, for DEFRA that routine beak trimming should not be implemented at this time because the risk to bird welfare was too great if there are pecking outbreaks. And these are some pictures from uh, Krista's thesis work. Um, we had some birds that were not beak trimmed for some work that she did and some that were. And you can see the difference in, in the sharpness and the hook on the beak tip. So the hen on the bottom right, she was infrared beak trimmed at day old. And she's now, in this picture, she's over 70 weeks of age. And then the hen on the right, you can see how much sharper the beak is. Now, generally, in the UK, organic birds are not trimmed routinely. They just get trimmed if there is then a, a, an outbreak of pecking or cannibalism later on which has its own welfare consequences. So what's the problem with beak, timing, beak trimming? Excuse me. <clears throat> You're removing a very sensitive portion of the bird's anatomy. The, the beak is highly innervated with nerves. If you watch a hen manipulate things with their beak, they can be incredibly delicate and very precise. They can pick up very small morsels on the ground. They can pick things out with their beak. One of the major arguments about this is that by beak trimming, you're not treating the problem, which is why do birds peck each other? You're just dulling the tool with which they use to peck each other. A method that's still very common through the rest of the world is to use the hot blade method of trimming. That is associated with neuroma formation, which is akin to amputation pain, particularly if it's done in adult birds. So if there's a pecking outbreak, like I mentioned in the organic flocks, they don't beak trim routinely, but if they have to go in and beak trim when the birds are adults, then it can cause uh, serious long-term pain consequences for the birds. The infrared treatment has much shorter, uh, short-term effects on uh, in indications of pain-related behaviors. There's some reduction in feeding behavior very early on after the technique, but then the chicks uh, recover and carry on as normal. <clears throat> and I guess what you really need to think about it's these dilemmas whenever you talk about these procedures is what's worse? Is it worse to not trim birds and for them to suffer a feather pecking outbreak later on in life? Or do you take the risk not to beak trim everything and some flocks will be fine, but some flocks aren't? And that, that's a real dilemma for everyone involved in these issues. There are other ways to pre uh, potentially prevent feather pecking later in life. Uh, there's been a lot of work at Bristol University, among other places, looking at things like this and, and in Denmark. So one technique during the rearing phase, which is what we're talking about at the moment, is to use dark brooders. So rather than having uh, heat lamps out in the open under the, the bright lights where chicks may want to gather to sleep and, and settle, they get disturbed by other chicks running around uh, on the floor. So if you have places kind of a bit like this table here where you've got dark plastic strips hanging down and the heat lamps are underneath, the birds can go under those dark brooders where they can rest uh, peacefully without getting disturbed by the more active chicks. And that seems to have a preventative effect on feather pecking later in life. Another thing to consider is if the rearing environment can be made as similar to the laying environment later in life, the transition from uh, rear into lay is more seamless uh, and that seems to also be uh, preventative against feather pecking. And another factor, and this isn't an exhaustive list, I must say, but another uh, factor which has been shown to be quite helpful is that you get chicks used to novelty, so that novelty is not so overwhelming when the, when the birds are older. So you get the chicks used to being uh, inspected at various times of day, wearing different clothing. Don't always wear a navy blue boiler suit, because then the birds will freak out if somebody goes in in a white boiler suit. 
uh, getting used to noises, maybe playing a radio at different times, the sound of a bucket dropping, things like this. this these are all preventative things, help the birds habituate to novelty later in life. So in case you're not familiar with what feather pecking looks like, um, the top left hand picture is fairly mild feather pecking. Feather pecking tends to start at the base of the tail near the preen gland. Um, there was some evidence to suggest that perhaps preen oil makes the feathers tasty there. Uh, but I think there is also an element that pecking the bird there is furthest away from the, the sharp end where you might get uh, told off. Um, but and you can see it, it kind of spreads up the back and then the, the bird in the bottom right, she's, um, they also get referred to as oven ready hens. Um, yeah, <laughs> lovely. Um, but you can see uh, all her primary tail feathers are pecked down to the, to the wing vein um, and she's really lost almost all of her feathers. So it can be, can be quite serious. And this has concerns for uh, skin damage because the hen's lost her protective feather covering for um, being able to maintain body heat. So she has to eat a lot more to maintain body heat and so on. Okay, so we've reared our uh, pullets and um, beak trimming being our main issue. And so now we transfer our birds to the laying farm at about 16 weeks of age. And we've got some choices here of the types of housing systems that are permissible in the EU. Uh, one of those is the enriched cage, which is also called a furnished cage. We don't use conventional cages anymore in Europe. Those were banned in 2012, although of course they're still very prevalent in the rest of the world. So if they're not put into uh, enriched cages, they will go into a non-cage system. And that's kind of a global umbrella that covers several types of uh, egg marketing standards. So you can have barn eggs, which are reared uh, in a non-cage system, but they don't have access to the outdoors. They can be uh, free range egg production, so it's a barn house, but they've got pot holes that let them have access to range. Um, or there can be organic production. Organic production is a whole different set of standards and regulations I'm not really going to go into because it makes up such a small proportion of our flock in the UK. But within barn and free range housing, the way you lay out the house can be different. We have something called single level, which is lots of litter on the floor and then a raised area where the feeders and drinkers are and nest boxes in the middle. And that's called single level or flat deck. Or you can have what you can see in this uh, bottom right hand picture, you can have uh, multi-tier, it's also called Avery. Um, you can't use that production system for organic eggs, but it looks like this picture on the right. You basically have levels that the birds can negotiate up and down, okay? And as I said, if it's, uh, they also have outdoor access, the eggs are classed as free range or organic. So if we talk about enriched cages first, what are the kind of housing issues birds might encounter if they're, they're housed in that environment? Well, the major criticism of cages of any sort is that hens cannot express all natural behaviors. Now, definitely furnished cages or enriched cages are better than the conventional cage. They have a limited ability to forage. Um, in this picture, um, you can see in the uh, bottom left-hand side, they've got a scratch mat. This design isn't used very much anymore. This is one of the early cage designs. Um, you can probably see it's a bit dirty. If a hen lays an egg there, it's gonna make the egg dirty. So we don't see that kind of astroturf surface so much anymore. But anyway, this is kind of roughly what they're like. This um, feed auger tube, can be turned on once a day, 10 times a day, whatever the farmer wants. It deposits a small amount of layers mash onto the mat. The birds can peck at it, they try and dust bathe in it, but they basically peck at it and they eat it. So they can show this kind of limited foraging behavior. They also have a nest box, and that's really important because the whole reason we house laying hens is, is to get them to lay eggs. They're highly motivated to show nesting behavior. And this is what the nests sort of look like on this picture on the right. So again, there's a mat, so it's a, supposed to be a more comfortable place for them to sit and lay their egg. And it's also got some kind of uh, cover, this is the case, it's plastic strips, to give them some kind of seclusion because in the wild they would see, seek a secluded nesting site. But there's no nesting material there. They don't have straw. They can't build a nest, which they would do if they were uh, out in the wild. The space allowances are more generous than our conventional cages. I know this is different to the, the Canadian regulations, but um, our minimum cage size used to be 550 square centimeters per hen. This is now 750 square centimeters. And just to give you an idea of how that compares, our requirements for the barn and free range housing 
um, is 111, sorry, 1,111 square centimeters per bird. So you can see that that is double the old conventional cage and the, and the furnished cage sits somewhere in between. Some other issues with furnished cages beside the whole issue of freedom of behavior is that you're still keeping birds on wire floors and wire floor can lead to foot damage. It causes something called bumble foot, a big swelling on the bottom of the foot, which is sore. The birds don't pre perform as much weight bearing exercise as they do in non-cage systems, so they don't have the bone strength of their non-cage sisters. And there can be competition for resources, particularly at the feeders. Now there's requirements for how much uh, trough space birds are given, but you still see when fresh feed comes along the track, there's quite a lot of jostling and the birds lower down in the pecking order get pushed away from the feed trough. But what's good about it, okay? This is, you're gonna see this. Not every system's good, not every system's bad. So, so furnished cages still have their benefits. You have relatively small groups compared to the loose house systems, so they're relatively easy to inspect. So you, you might have a cage that has 80 birds in it. That's much easier than looking at a segment in a loose house of 4,000 birds. So if you think a bird's being bullied or uh, has been injured, if you give yourself enough time to look, you can see all the birds usually. They do have this secluded nest area and they have perches, which is really important because the hens are highly motivated to perch and they have 15 centimeters of perch space per bird. And um, we must never forget uh, the issues of mortality. Mortality in cages uh, is the lowest of all the systems on offer. Um, of course, it depends on how quick you die, I guess, but uh, where systems where fewer birds die, you have to take that into consideration when you're considering the welfare of systems. So let's move on to non-cage housing. So what are the potential housing issues uh, in those systems where you've got thousands of birds on the floor? Well, they're, they're pretty big flocks. They're much bigger than uh, would occur naturally. And so there's an inability to recognize flock mates because there's just purely too many birds for a hen to be able to recognize all 4,000 or 16,000 birds in her group. And so there can be frequent interactions with strange birds because birds don't recognize each other. So there can be greater aggression than in places where you have uh, stable hierarchies like you tend to get in cages. As a farmer, inspecting individuals can be difficult. So you have to walk your flock um, once or twice a day. And can you honestly say you saw every bird? No, probably not. You do get a feel for the flow of the birds and you notice ones that aren't maybe moving away from you. Maybe you're sitting looking a bit ill or fed up. But still, inspecting individual birds is difficult in these big systems. In the systems in the UK, we always have access to litter. One third of the floor area has to be litter. And so in theory, that's wonderful. The birds can dust bathe and they can forage. But what are they foraging for? Okay, in the UK, it's nothing other than wood shavings and droppings. And so there's very little positive feedback coming from uh, wood shavings and poop, right? If they were finding stuff, that would be great. If they could find grubs and worms and bugs, that would be much more exciting. But uh, generally, the uh, vets discourage people from seeding the litter with stuff because they don't want the birds to be ingesting their own droppings, right? Because you're perpetuating the, uh, the parasite cycle and so on. <coughs> Freedom of movement, it's, it's really important. It matters a lot to people and I, undoubtedly to the birds, but the freedom of movement and the structures that are in the house, such as perches, as you see on the bottom right here, can be responsible for greater levels of keel bone damage in these systems. Uh, birds are laying in almost an egg a day and so they have quite a fragile skeleton as, as the months progress. And we see a lot of keel bone damage in birds in these loose house systems, which is potentially painful. If the birds are free reign, so if they're given access to the outdoors, again, also nice uh, in theory and in practice, but our houses in the UK are really big. There are about 16,000 hens uh, in, a, in a house. That's the maximum size. And so those are static fixed houses that are on a, a concrete plinth. They're not little mobile houses that you can transfer to fresh pasture between each flock. And so it's a static house and the ground outside it gets worn down. And if you've had a house in the same place for 10 or 15 years, the grass is hard to get it to grow back. You also start uh, getting back into problems we saw in the 1950s, things like fowl sick, where the, the, the land has just had a big buildup of bird droppings. 
In order to encourage birds to go out, you really need shelter, trees or platforms that the birds can go under to encourage them to go outside. Remember, these birds come from the jungle. They're used to jungle cover. They're frightened of predators. So that is really necessary. Well, it's helpful to get birds to, to show ranging. But birds might actually be discouraged from going outside by the producer because it's expensive for the producer to have to essentially pay for hens to go outside. They, they use more energy, so they eat more feed, they lay more eggs outside, which you probably never collect, and so you lose income. There are still issues of competition for resources. Um, for example, uh, we find quite commonly that there are favored nest boxes uh, in, in loose house systems, and you can get birds piling up on each other. Um, if birds get fright in these big houses, you can get birds panicking and running down the end of the shed and, and causing smothering. But what's good? Well, one of the major things that captures people in these systems is they do have freedom of behavior. They can perch, they can run, they can fly, they can wing flap, they can forage, they can dust bathe. And that is really captivating to, to us as their observers. You know, it's joyful to watch hens behaving naturally, but it doesn't come without its risks. Are the outdoor areas always enticing? Probably not. We, we see less and less of this, but in an, in an effort to keep the birds' feet clean so they're not dragging in lots of mud and water and then making the litter all soggy and horrible inside, the farmers do things to try and keep the feet clean and, and keep the moisture off. But that's not going to encourage a bird outside. <coughs> Excuse me. So after a year of having our hens uh, in their housing system, we've been collecting eggs off them, Egg quality and egg numbers start to decline. Uh, in the European Union, we're not allowed to do forced molt with uh, total feed deprivation. Uh, in, in the UK, the molting just doesn't, doesn't happen at all. And so they, birds get picked up for slaughter around 70 to 80 weeks of age, although the birds are getting older and we're trying to take them further on. And sadly, a spent laying hen, as they're called, they have little financial worth. Depending on the market with broiler meat, sometimes the producer has to pay to have the hens taken away. That doesn't happen too often. Usually they get a few pence for a hen, and they are taken away for slaughter, and they're processed for food, dog food and soup and things like that. But at this time, because the bird's been laying an egg every day for most of her life, her skeleton is very fragile, and so they're, they're very susceptible to injury. Uh, this is the depopulation in process at our own farm a few years ago. You can see the birds are being carried, several hens in each hand. They then get dropped into these uh, transport boxes where the guy on the right kind of gives the tray a shake to get the birds to stand up and right themselves, and then pushes the tray shut. So they're, they're getting handled quickly and they're, and they're delicate. So this is some work we did quite a few years ago now. We were looking at birds uh, at the depopulation process. Uh, this data here is from 24 different farms <coughs> where we collected about 90 to 100 birds from each farm. And we examined them by radiographs to look for bone fracture. And we also did bone breaking tests to look at how strong the bones were in different systems. And so we still had the conventional cages at that time. And the thing I want to point out to you is that if you look at the proportion of birds that have new bone fracture, first of all, we found that most of those new bone fractures were to the wings, and it tended to be much greater prevalence in birds that were taken out of conventional cages. If you compare that to about 9% of birds in free range. And you can explain that when you watch the depopulation process. Um, the birds are getting pulled out of a cage opening and they're flapping because they're frightened and they're, they're getting grabbed by their legs so they're trying to right themselves and they're catching their wings on the, on the cage opening. It's less in the furnished cage where the, or the enriched cage where the cage opening is much bigger but you still see it. We can distinguish between old and new bone fracture. In the radiograph, you can look for the formation of a callus, which starts quite quickly after bone fracture occurs. And so the radiographer could determine between what was new and old bone fracture. And I, I think these figures are particularly shocking. Half of the birds in loose house systems have some kind of old bone fracture. Now, if any of you have ever fractured a bone, you know how painful it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but most of this is to the keel. And there is evidence from other work that keel bone fracture is painful. What we don't know, and we didn't distinguish this at this time, is whether what's known as deviations, and that's where the, the keel 
takes on a curved uh, look, probably from constant compression, like against a perch. We don't know if that is painful, but in this study we didn't distinguish between the two, and it's a lot of birds that are showing bone damage. But you can also see, if you look at the bone strength data, that birds that are kept in cages, whether it's conventional or furnished cages, they have considerably weaker bones than the birds in the loose house systems. Okay, you can break the tibia bone uh, at less Newton force than you can in the free range of barn. So there is limitation in weight bearing exercise in those systems, which helps them to have strong bones. The issues that we're facing now in the UK, um, there's been a recent pledge by major retailers to go cage free by 2025. Mm -hmm. I know you're facing similar issues here in Canada. That's been a, a fairly recent development. Uh, it, it has the free range egg producers really concerned because as you will recall, we've got about half of our flock are free range. They get to choose they don't get to choose. They get paid a premium price for their products. So the eggs that you buy in the supermarket, they're more expensive if you buy free range than if you buy a cage. Barn makes up very little of our production, but they get a bit of a premium as well. If we go down the route of almost all of our flocks being free range, the free range producers are going to be concerned that they aren't going to get this uh, premium price anymore. And also, as you have picked up on, I hope, Free range doesn't necessarily mean everything's hunky-dory for birds, right? There's, there, there are problems there. I definitely think we're going to have to grow our barn system production, which is little understood by the, the purchaser. If they go in and they're going to buy eggs, they don't want to buy cage, they buy free range. They don't understand what barn means. So there needs to be some education there to, to help the whole uh, cage-free by 2025 thing progress. We also have a concern here in that uh, just before the ban on the conventional cage, uh, just before 2012, there was a lot of investment into enriched cages through the UK. So some places have had these enriched cage systems in for only uh, five years, and by the time the ban comes in, it will only have been 13 years or so. Uh, that's not a good return on their very heavy investment in these systems. And I think I've talked about most of the rest of those things. The other thing that's really uh, a problematic for us at the moment is avian influenza. Um, some years it, it doesn't happen very much, but this year it's been a, a big problem on the continent and we're starting to see the effects in Europe, uh, in the UK, excuse me. Uh, just before I came away on the 31st of January, there were six confirmed cases of avian influenza in the UK. Um, there were game bird farms that had outbreaks, but also turkeys uh, and a couple of backyard flocks all in England. Uh, I live in Scotland, so we're thinking of erecting Hadrian's Wall again, to, if, if that would only work. Um, but we have actually had one peregrine falcon that was uh, found in the southern ha part of uh, Scotland that was confirmed with AI, but we, we haven't had it in any poultry flocks yet. Now, as a, 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 of a consequence, knowing that what was going on on the continent on the 6th of December, all the devolved administrations in the UK agreed to a housing order so all our poultry are currently housed, that includes our free range flocks, that has its own challenges for the farmers whose hens are used <coughs> to going outside and suddenly find the door shut on them. But so far it hasn't been a welfare problem. But AI has real welfare implications of course if flocks need to be destroyed, financial implications for the farmers and it could also potentially have a food supply. Uh, impact and of course it impacts research because I can't go out on farm at the moment to, to do any uh, studies so that's my own personal problem so just a summary on, on this bit of the talk you can see that egg producing hens um, they've had to really they diversified from this multi-purpose bird to these specific strains of chickens housing methods they've gone through really rapid changes in quite a short space of time and that is both based on scientific evidence for what's good for birds. And looking at Ian, who's done an awful lot of work uh, in his time over you know, what do birds want. But it's also fads that are driven by the consumer. And people do not want to see hens in cages. Um, so both those things feed into the way housing method uh, fads change. The way in which we house and manage hens certainly has consequences for their well-being but both from behavior perspective but also health, health perspective, 
None of the systems are perfect. It's just not that clear cut to say hens are, you know, all hens should be free range. It's all great. It isn't. Every system has its uh, drawbacks. So we need to continue to endeavor to do better, to find the best ways to house them that are sensitive to their needs, but still means we can have a, a productive egg market. Okay, that's the hen housing thing. I wanted to go on to something uh, about bringing science to the, to the layman, which is something we don't often do when we're in a research environment. I got an email a couple of years ago from a, a producer down the road from me who said to me, could I genotype his hens? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, well, I can't, but I got in touch with Ian Dunn. He's a geneticist and um, avian... Uh, reproductive scientist at the Rosen Institute. I said, Ian, can you genotype this guy's chickens? He's wanting to get his flock genotype. And um, the reason for that will become clear in a moment. But anyway, both Ian and I are members of the World Poultry Science Association. Uh, I'm, I'm the current UK president and Ian's a council member. And we have summer scholarship projects which, in which we give students a little bit of money to do a project, say for their bachelor's or their master's program. We thought this would make a great project for a student. And so uh, we got a very clever bachelor's student called Jenna who was interested in doing a, a, a poultry project. And she applied for the funding and she got it. And so we got her set up so she had um, a bit of resources to do this genotyping. Because although the technology exists, Ian would need to get a technician to spend his time doing it. Somebody would have to go blood sample the flock. You know, all those things cost money. And we knew this guy was just, he was a fancy breed producer. He didn't want to be paying thousands of pounds. So this is the route we went down because we also thought in the spirit of WPSA, which seeks to educate and promote research, this would be a nice way to make use of the resources we have in Scotland to help this guy out. So Jenna took on the project. And what it was is this guy, uh, Johnny Templeton, he reared cream leg bar chickens for the show ring. And this is what they look like here. They're these beautiful birds. They're a, a combined breed um, from barred rock, brown leghorn, and aracana breeds of chicken. And they've got this lovely barred gray plumage. And in the female, which you see on the bottom right there, they've got this salmon tan breast feathers. Very, very pretty birds with this lovely set of feathers on the head. And uh, Johnny had noticed for some years that he occasionally bred a white or Apache bird. And for the show ring, that's a defect. He can't show a white uh, cream leg bar. And so what he wanted to know was, which were the culprits in his flock? Um, now, <laughs> yeah, you can imagine what he's going to do with them, right? Um, so uh, white feathering um, is caused by a recessive gene. It's a mutation of the tyrosinase gene. Um, which means that melanin synthesis fails. And you need to, because it's recessive, you need to have two copies of the gene for it to, to crop up, which is why it's so hard for him to pick out who the carriers are in his flock. So the objective of Jenna's bachelor's project was to identify the heterozygous carriers of the mutation within this cream leg bar flock. So Johnny had uh, 35 adults. He had 14 males and 21 females. And Jenna and I went down to his farm. I took a pinprick blood sample, just, just, it was just a tiny, tiny amount of blood we had to take from each bird. And uh, Jenna took the little blood samples back and she extracted the DNA and then she used polymerase chain reaction techniques to replicate the DNA thousands and thousands of times so she had lots of it. And um, then she chopped up the DNA and she used gel electrophoresis um, to drag the DNA chunks across the plate. And she had control DNA samples from homozygous red and homozygous white chickens so that she knew where the banding would be on her uh, electrophoresis plate. And by this way, she was able to identify the heterozygous carriers. So if you look at her electrophoresis plates, she loaded, oh, it's a bit of a typo there. I was supposed to say top of the gel, not taupe. Um, she loaded her wells at the top of her plate, and then she, she plugged it in. And um, if you look at her control bands, she had these, uh, she had two samples of the um, homozygous uh, white uh, birds. So they have bandings at the 345 base pairs. So the, the lighter, the, the smaller the base pairs, the further they drag on the plate. And then she had these um, homozygous red chicken samples and they um, have base pairs of 481 base pairs, so they don't drag so far. 
And so she would expect to see, because we didn't have any of the all white birds, she knew all she was ever going to find are birds um, like this one that I've circled in red, the, the homozygous um, for uh, uh, the colored plumage. And then she has the heterozygous. She's got two faint bands here um, for the birds that were heterozygous, and those are the carriers. So she did this for all the birds, and uh, she was able to identify that they had 21 homozygous dominant birds for the colored plumage, which is great. That's quite a high proportion of the, the birds in the flock. But there were unfortunately 13 that were heterozygous, so those are carriers for that white gene. Now if you, if you do your maths, that only adds up to 34, and she had 35 birds. And uh, the problem was that one of the blood samples, she wasn't able to um, get it to uh, work properly when she did her DNA extraction for whatever reason. And so we kind of had to, to go back to, to basics and, and look at who that bird was. It was a male and who he had bred with, who, who we knew uh, that this male, his name was Sven, um, he, had, he had bred with a, a female that we had identified as being homozygous for the colored plumage. And all of their offspring were homozygous um, for the colored uh, feathering genotype, uh, phenotype. So we, could, I, we were pretty clear that he was a homozygous uh, colored plumage male. So that was quite satisfying. So now we had all our figures for all 35 birds. And then uh, Jenna used the Hardy-Weinberg equation to, and used a chi-square test to see if the proportion of birds in Johnny's flock was about where you would expect them to be. And uh, the Hardy-Weinberg equation said that we should expect um, of a flock of 35 that 23 would be homozygous dominant, about 11 heterozygous and about one to be homozygous. And she had 22 and 13 and zero. And so the chi-square test told her it wasn't, it wasn't different to expected. We had to get some statistics in there, right? Because this was for a bachelor's project. And so, um, OK, that's great. We have this information. So in order to prevent this guy breeding further carriers, really, he should exclude those heterozygous individuals from the breeding program. Right? Um, but you don't want to pass them on to other people to breed the white feathering if you're concerned about being a show person. But he had a really small flock. And so if he'd done that, you would have really increased the risk of inbreeding in the flock. I mean, he was careful not to breed sisters with fathers, uh, daughters with fathers and things. But if you're going to reduce your, your gene, gene pool, that uh, can raise different genetic issues. Or the alternative would be that he could gradually remove carriers from the population over a number of generations. But then he would have been looking for us to genotype his flock on, on a regular basis. So that wasn't um, too popular either. Now, uh, very sadly, um, when Jenna had finished her thesis, we, we contacted Johnny and his wife to say, hey, we've got, got the results here for you. And he'd actually passed away. Uh, it was very sad. And his wife had, she wasn't really the person interested in the poultry flock, so she had just sold the flock on. So it was all for naught, I'm afraid. But anyway, it made a very good project at the time. <laughs> You're all on tenterhooks. Uh, but anyway, the point was we were able to show that the application of modern, simple DNA genotyping techniques can really help a small breeding program in theory. Um, it could enable breeding standards to be maintained effectively, especially for these recessive traits, and it could improve flock purity and maximize the business potential. Johnny would sell his uh, breeding birds to people who were looking for cream-like bars. They wanted to increase the gene pool in their breeding flock. So in theory, it, it had really nice application. It just never quite came to fruition. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>